Hello, my name is Jason Green and I'm getting ready to demo the duty drawback uh, vertical that has been added to AX2012. Uh, this solution was built uh, inside of AX2012. It's with 100% standalone objects. So there's no possibility of affecting any base AX2012 code or any customized codes, code. So again, all these objects are net new and do not affect any existing objects. So you can add this on to any um, install of AX2012 you have without any possibility of, of stepping on any customized code because these are all net new objects. All right, so let's begin by talking about what a duty drawback is. So duty drawback for uh, companies is when you uh, import merchandise. In, in this example, I'm going to be bringing uh, merchandise into the U.S., U.S., United States of America, and then exporting it out to Canada in this example. But any NAFTA countries uh, work. Uh, but in this example, it's going to be coming into the U.S. and then exporting to Canada. So these are for companies that... Uh, have a central import process in the United States, but have business also in Canada, Mexico, uh, other NAFTA countries. And what happens is when you import it, you have to pay duties on it to the uh, uh, CBP, uh, Customs and uh, Border Protection. And what this is doing is it is uh, then in turn shipping that product to Canada or Mexico or another country and paying duties again because you have to pay when you export out of the U.S. into Canada. But what the duty drawback program is, is when you do that, you are allowed to claim that initial duty back from when you imported it. And there's there's time fences. So there's a maximum of three years you can go back. So if you import something and then you export it within a three-year window from, let's say, today, uh, you could go back three years and claim any of these drawbacks you've done and within a maximum of three years that you uh, once you've exported it to before you claim the, the the drawback so in rough numbers let's say you bring in you know a thousand dollars worth a uh, million dollars worth of product into the u.s and you have to pay twenty thousand dollars in duty because it's got a percentage duty on it and then in turn let's say half of that product you ship to canada in which case you pay you know, X amount of duties on it when you go to Canada. What this is saying is if you can prove, which is what I'm getting ready to show you with this program, that you shipped that product and paid the duties when you shipped it to Canada, you can file with the CBP, a Customs and Border Protection, to get back uh, half of that money because you shipped half of it to Canada, so you can get $10,000 of that back. So basically this allows AX to be a profit center for you, meaning you can gain uh, back the duties that you've been paid to the government, and yet you legally have the obligation to claim them back. So that's what duty drawback is, and there's lots of companies out there that do this for you, but they charge huge amounts of fees, and you have to send them all your data, and they take it, and they manipulate it, and they file on your behalf, and then the CDP comes, and they review it, and they ask, can you prove that you these sales orders are in your system, and can you prove that you did use a FIFO layer? And can you prove that that's the amount you pay on commercial invoice? So what I've done is I've created all that inside of D360 Dynamics AX 2012, and it allows for any audit to go off without a hitch because every transaction, every purchase that you bought the product in, and every sale that you made out is all contained in your ERP system. And it links the records via FIFO method, which is what they require. And everything is traceable and you don't have, it's not, this doesn't exist in multiple systems. It, it exists in one system, AX2012, and you can prove this out to CVP and claim, and it also generates the files to send to them, which is the majority of, of the time it takes to do this because they have a specific file format you have to electronically submit to them into their ACE program, in which case it automatically accepts it and then it automatically pays you. So let's uh, move on. So there, there are several documents that the CVP published that are the requirements of, of the format in which they need to uh, be sent this information. There's the interface requirements. It's a 39-page document talking all about the controller identifiers and the ports and uh, applications and 
tons of data that has to be put in the file that has to be submitted to them. There's also the output uh, format requirements, which is called the CATAIR, C-A-T-A-I-R format. It's a 106 page document, which has thousands and thousands of uh, requirements of each level of, of line because it's a space limited uh, file format. It's not EDI, it's not XML, it's space limited. So every line has to have 80 characters and every character has to have a specific thing in each record. So this was the majority of the time of, of translating this from this document into AX, which is what it does and this AX automatically puts it into this format. Then there's these condition codes that once it's been submitted, what it looks like when it comes back. So all of that is, uh, all these codes are, are built into it. And then uh, the, also the CBP requires you to take your entry summaries or your commercial invoices, in which case when you bring it into the US, it's called the entry form 7501 in your commercial invoice. Uh, they have to, they may audit you and say, I want you to actually bring this data up in case we ask, but there's the ability to link that to uh, the documents in this format. And this is an example of a B3 document, which is the export import document into Canada and the commercial invoice that's associated with that. So when audited by CDP, these, they'll ask for the file format that you send them, and then they'll ask for the supporting entry forms and the export forms, which is what these documents are. And the next thing to do is we can just get right into the product demo so we can see how uh, AX 2012 uh, does this. All right. So in this example, well, I'm in a AX 2012 instance. The first thing we're going to go through is the uh, parameters that are used to uh, set up this uh, program. So. Let me, so this is a X2012. Uh, the first thing I'm going to look at is the drawback parameters. Under setup, under accounts receivable, there's a new section called drawback parameters. Under drawback parameters, it has many tabs you have to set up in order before you can start functioning with this in the system. The first thing you need to do is say, what allowable transactions do I allow my system to match to for a drawback? Majority of everyone that uses this is just going to use purchase orders, meaning I purchase it and therefore uh, when I purchase it, I, I pay duty that I can link to it in the system. Uh, I also have transaction in here because there are some instances where people purchase it and use a, a movement journal to bring it in and then they tie their drawback to that, but the more common one is purchase order. So this allows us to be able to, to see the transactions that I can link to versus having counting journals and having inventory adjustment journals and everything. You know, this, this says this is the only thing I can claim a drawback against these transaction types. Then the running total transaction type list sh says, show me all the transactions that uh, make up a FIFO layer. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. But when we, when we have a out or a sales out, we also have to prove out that uh, the sell out is in the right FIFO layer, meaning if I bought something for 100 units and then I sold it inside the United States, 100 units of it, then I bought it a second time for 100 units, then, uh, then I sold it to Canada, it's not going to link to the very first FIFO layer because it was fully consumed in country. The second purchase will be able to be linked to it. So these are the just the references of the transaction types that cons that that make up a FIFO layer. So we know we're in the right FIFO layer. Um, uh, we're, we're utilizing the right FIFO layer method. The next list is an inclusion, meaning uh, here's all the customers when I sell out of country. So if I'm in the U.S. and I'm selling to Canada, or I'm selling to uh, Mexico or I'm selling to a, a NAFTA country, these are all the ones that are valid to be uh, part of uh, the drawback. The reason why I didn't include this on the customer record is because I didn't want to affect any standard AX code. I want this to be completely self-sufficient. So therefore, this is an inclusion list of customers. This could be changed to be uh, a certain group on the customer record but then I wouldn't be able to make the claim that this is 100% agnostic of AX code or any, and it won't affect any base uh, objects. 
So that's why this is a list of all the customers that can be included in a drawback when sold out of, out of country. Uh, on the same side, vendors. These are all the vendors that can be included. So on your purchase orders, your allowable transaction types, you said purchase order or movement journals were allowable. This is saying, but, but there can be some vendors that are, are, are excluded, meaning sometimes you may have a vendor that uh, you don't pay tariffs on or you don't, isn't part of duty drawback and therefore you want to exclude from this process. This gives you the ability to specifically exclude vendors from this process. Not a lot of people will have this, but the functionality is there in case you do want it to automatically happen, just so you don't accidentally start a drawback against a vendor purchase that doesn't qualify. The next is a list of statuses that we're going to use on our drawbacks. It's user definable, so users can set up as many statuses as they want. Um, I didn't want to hard code any statuses because I wanted the users to be able to pick any statuses they want. There's also the ability you're going to see here in a minute is to void a drawback, meaning I've created a drawback and it's tied itself to the uh, FIFO layer, yet then you realize that something's wrong with it. It gives you the ability to void the drawback, in which case it releases all of those transactions to the FIFO layer again. So if you start a new drawback, those transactions are available. And by having a, a status that disallows uh, uh, void, meaning if I've accepted it or if I've submitted it to the CVP, I don't ever want someone to be able to go in and void it because that's already now an official record that's sent into their system and therefore it shouldn't be able to be voided at that point. So that's like a fail safe. The, the, any, any statuses that have that check will prevent you from voiding it because it's past the point of no return and it's been sent to the CVP. Uh, the next one are a few settings. So the drawback number is going to, every time you generate a new one, it's going to need a sequence number. So you get a sequence number. You also have an internal tracking number that's required by the CDP, and that is a uh, number that's put in the uh, cat tear export format. So it's another number sequence. And then these next two numbers, this number right here is the CDP file code, the, the code in which the CDP assigns to your legal entity. So in this case, the legal entity I'm working with, the, the, the CBP has assigned a three-digit code, 8HK. So every install of, of this uh, drawback program will have a unique identifier because this is put in the exported format that's sent to them to know who is submitting this drawback. The next uh, parameter is a time fence, meaning how far back in the past should, when I start a drawback intermit, should it consider uh, sales orders uh, and purchase orders because there, there is a time fence. Like I said at the beginning of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, I said it's three years, so I put in a three-year time fence. Now the CBP may change that in the future, so therefore I made it a primer, so it's completely customizable. Uh, I'm going to skip the file export uh, format tab next because that one's going to take a while to explain, but let me just go through the next, next two, the file location. This is going to be first, when I export the file to send to the CVP, what's the format? In this case, it's CS, uh, CSV. It can be anything. It can be text. It can be .xxx. They don't care what the format is, uh, the, the uh, extension, but it needs to be something in order to you know, categorize it and save it somewhere so you can review it. Um, so that's the file format extension that's put on the file when it's exported. And then this is the location that when you export the file, it's going to go to. And in a minute, we're going to talk about importing files. We're going to be importing data in order to help match uh, data in our system. So this is also where you put the file import location format, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But again, that's the, the file format extension, and then we're going to put it when we export it here in a minute. The next tab is called the CVP unit of measure. This gives us the ability to define units of measure that uh, uh, CBP may define that are different from our standard unit of measures in AX2012. We may have uh, NO as a unit of measure which doesn't equal one or PCS or PRS or U UN for unit or HUN for hundreds. So since CBP doesn't follow the AX2012 uh, unit, unit of conversion measures, uh, but it does need its conversion factor in order to generate the file, this gives us the ability to go in and put their conversion unit of measures and what an hour on AX's side, what that converts down to to an each. So that means if they pass us a, a HUN, we know that in AX that needs to be 100 as a multiplier. 
If they pass DOZ, we know we need to multiply it by 12 because that's a dozen. So these, this gives you the ability for CVP to have their own unit, unit of measure. Um, unit of measures, yet we know how to get back to our each's in uh, Dynamics 2012. So the last uh, drawback parameter uh, we're going to look at here is the file is the 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 uh, the uh, file export. So this is where it, most of the the work happens. Um, this is where you go in and define again. If I go back to the CBP, this hundred and six page document here talks about. What needs to go in every one of these records, a record A, a record B, a record 10, a record 12, a record 41, a record 42, in order to submit to their ACE program for it to automatically um, uh, receive it, process it, and automatically pay your claim out. So let me go back to our application. So since CBP changes the definitions of what goes in what location periodically, it is completely uh, user definable, meaning I can define a, a record, in this case a record A, a record B, a record 10, a record 31. These are all the ones that, if you go through the 106-page document CBP put out, are the required um, records. And then once you select a record, it defines what goes in each value. Like I said at the beginning, every record in the Cantair export has to be 80 characters. So this basically says record A, uh, starting position one, ending one, has to have a, a value of A, and it's static. Uh, re record two through five is a is a filer code, and this is this is the code that's associated with our submission. Six through eight is our uh, uh, our receiver code, and then our communication password. Um, and, and notice when it's, it says static here, it means it, it takes whatever is in here and it puts in the, in the uh, file. If it ever says dynamic here, what it does is, is there is a class behind it which says positions five through 20. Since it's dynamic, it goes out and gets the current date and puts it in this format. And, and a lot of these you'll see a space filled, meaning that they're not using it yet. It's to be determined in the future. So static space field just means spaces are put in. So if you go through every one of these settings, there are hundreds and hundreds of lines of information that is required by the CVP. And some of these uh, records loop based on the number of, of um, sales orders you're claiming and HTC uh, uh, harmonization tariff uh, codes and things of that nature, units of measure, and, and there are also some in here that are, aren't being used, but could be used if you're a manufacturer, meaning if you import it and you use it in manufacturing, you can also use a drawback, meaning if you paid tariffs on something and you manufactured it and you sold it, it you, will, you can put a 50 record in here and prove that you've manufactured it, but in our, in our instance here, we're only talking about imports and then things that we sell via exports, which are your 70, 71, 72 records, which are these records. And then, then there's always the revenue totals and the revenue total by groupings records. And then there's always these block controllers, which says, okay, I, I'm now done with my submission. And this is the Z, which is the last record. So all of this has been set up and it's user definable, but the current CBP uh, ruling, this is all set up 100% correctly because we are using this right now to submit claims and they are being accepted currently with CBP. Now, two months from now, they may say on record type 41, this space field 63 through 80, we need you to put in 63, we need you to put a, a, a certain code or something. Well, then you can come in here and delete and add and add anything you want, make it dynamic and do whatever you want. So. This is this has been made for future expansion, so we can we can add to this as the CBP changes. There again, this you know this is September 2018. This document changes over time, so they could they could add more to the requirements in the future. But for now, this is this is set up to be accurate. 
So now, now that said, let's just go through an example of a uh, of, of, uh, of submission. So once we've went through parameters, there's, there's a few things here we can also look at. Under inquiries, we've got a duty drawback item prioritization. And what this is, is a, is a, a small program that was written. And it goes out and it loops through all the transactions based on the customers that you said are allowable, the vendors that you said aren't allowable, and then the time fence that you said, and it goes through and it finds all the items that have the ability to, for a drawback to be claimed based on the time fence and based on the customer and the amount that the drawback will be for. So, and then it sorts it by that. So it knows kind of which ones you should file a drawback for because you should do the ones that give you the biggest bang for your buck and then work your way down the list. So this is a, basically a prioritization list and these are the order in which the drawbacks you should work on. All right, so, and then there's a, a duty drawback status inquiry, which basically shows all the drawbacks that you filed, what their statuses are, had they been paid, how long, how long it's been since they've been claimed. Uh, you can export this to Excel and do any analysis that you want, so there's also that. So let's, let's go through the process of actually filing a drawback. So under common, uh, the first thing we're gonna, place we're gonna go to is drawbacks. So once you start a drawback, what it's gonna do is it pre-filtered all this. So it's only showing the customers that you said are valid. It only shows the, the sales orders that were within the time fence that you said that they were. And it also color codes this. If you've already filed a, a drawback against one of these lines, it, it makes it red so it says you can't use this one again, but it still shows in case you wanna uh, keep a history of what you've been working on. So in our case here, we're just gonna use one for 1027, which is one of the ones at the top of the list that we just saw. And here are all the, this, that item that is within the last two years that are available for a drawback to be claimed on. So I'm going to select them all and I'm going to click next. What this is going to do is it's going to go and find the history of that item and find, it goes through our entire history and it builds a screen for us. And what this is doing is saying, here's all my sales orders that I've said I want to file a climb back. Uh, a drawback against. And as I click them, it's this middle section is going to show me the allowable transactions that I said I wanted to be allowed. And if I go back to the parameters, let's review that, that's these types. It's purchase orders or movement journals. So it's only showing me purchase or movement journals, in which case this is a movement journal. So as I, as I go through it, it shows how many times I've purchased this throughout history. I could have purchased it 5, 10, 15, 20 times, but this is only saying I've only bought this item one time. And as I also go through this, it's also showing me the FIFO layer, all the transactions that make up the FIFO layer. And again, if I go back to my parameters, it's showing these transaction types. And what it's doing is it's building, whoops, it's building a running quantity total FIFO layer, meaning I bought 370 of them, which is this, this movement journal here. And then I sold, 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 sold over these days. And this is what I have left. But it's saying I'm trying to file a climb bit, uh, drawback on four units. So what I could do is I could manually, one by one, every time I selected one of these, I could say I want to claim it on that purchase order. And I want to claim that line on that purchase order. And I could type in those units for each one, one by one by one. Or I built in an automation of auto match. And what auto match does is it cycles through all of these transactions and, and it figures out the right FIFO layer and it applies it to it automatically. So if you hit auto match, notice now this drawback quantity has been populated. So notice all the ones that, that need the application have been populated. So if there was two or three FIFO layers here, it may have assigned this one to the first FIFO layer, but maybe uh, this one here, since we sold it in country so many times, it may have required it to go to the second FIFO layer. Now that we're done, we hit apply. And what this does now is it locks all these records of the FIFA layer against this drawback. So now no one else can use that, which is what the CBP requires because they want to prove that once you've locked a FIFA layer to a drawback, you can't use that layer for any future drawbacks. So that goes through and it applies everything and it lets us know what's been assigned. So now all of these um, transactions, these are all the sales orders, now have all the applications. So now what you can do is uh, I, there is the process of what's called uh, auto retrieve data. 
And this is an, an automated process. Um, if the company that you're using to your importer of record, if it's you or if it's someone else, they can feed data into a, a, a table, which allows you to pre-populate the, the tariff amount and everything, which is basically, if you go to this here, it basically, your, your, your 7501 form, it lets you know the, for this instance, so for line one, it's saying we paid 27.3% tariffs on this or for a total of $21,584.98. So all of this is contained within a table. So what the, the program does is it goes out and fetches that information. Bring this back up. And what it does is it brings that data back. So now, once once this is all in, let me move this down a little bit so you can see it. So now, we our, our drawback is now completed and all the data is, is fulfilled. So the next thing that we want to do is typically companies have people to audit. You know, someone that created the uh, the drawback is also someone different that actually submits it. Uh, each each company is different, but for this instance, let's look at the one that we've created today, which is this one right here. Uh, it, it lets us know what the status is, and again, we talked about earlier, all these statuses are, are the user-definable ones you can set up yourself. So I'm going to say it's been prepared, so now I know this one's been prepared. Let me open this up a little more. Whoops. So we can see everything. So it's been prepared. On this date, it lets us know all the sales orders that are associated with it. And then what we can also do is, if we wanted to, we could auto retrieve the data again if, if more data was uh, needed. Uh, we can also attach. So some some companies they like to attach the uh, the uh, the actual PDFs of the uh, entry forms and the commercial invoices just so if they get audited, they they have it all within. Uh, AX 2012, they don't have to go to another system to get these documents. It's completely up to you, though. You don't have to attach them, but that is a some uh, some companies like to do that because it makes it to where everything that an auditor would ever need would be in one system, uh, AX 2012. Or you can just go to the other system that you've saved those documents or file share and bring them up, you know, but you could attach them here. Another thing you can do is you've got a few more uh, buttons up here. So audited. Audit is a function that says, if I was the one that created it, that I'm not granted to audit it, meaning a different user, a different person logged in would have to come in and audit it. If I was logged in to someone else and I had audited, it would say, okay, you're a different user and you're validating that you audited it, and it would put it audited by an audited date there. So that gives you the ability to say, I want two people to, to review this, the person that prepared it, and then someone different has to be the person that audits it. And sometimes that's a requirement when you submit it to CBP. They want to prove that one person creates them and someone else is physically required to audit it. So that's what that functionality is for. Then what you can do is there's there's two functions here. So let's just talk about the review button. The review allows you just to dump all the, all the data that's, that's, uh, that, that's uh, around this. And you can dump it to an Excel format, so you can do some analysis on it. You could come in and, and look at the data. You can sum it up. You can validate how much money uh, you're going to be getting. You can uh, do a pivot table, validate that all these sales orders and shipments and total number of units and drawback dates are all valid. So that's just the ability to review all the data and dump it to, to Excel. But, but the main thing, the very next step, is going to be the review cat there. This is when we're ready to submit. And this is where all of the, all of the setup that we did on the, uh, on the uh, parameters, all of this magic of record A, record B, record 10, 30, it take, all of this logic, once we come in and we go to here and we say review cat error. It takes all of this information and puts it into this format. So all of this data is 80 characters in length and it created the A record B 10, 30, and then it repeated the 30 and it did basically ran through the whole process that it was supposed to do and puts it in the right format. 
Now, I've submitted ones like this that are about a thousand records. I just did one that was, you know, a, a few records now, just so it would make the demo easier. But imagine thousands of records here uh, and having all the format correctly. And once you're once you validate that this is accurate, and, and also what you can do is it gives you the ability to also modify it at this point. This is like the step right before you submit to CPP. If you wanted to, you could come in here and you know, you know, for this instance, I want that to be uh, you know a one just because I found that they asked me to resubmit with a one in this position. You know, the, the error code came back and we just needed one thing changed on this one. Rather than going to code, the user has the ability to do it. Then once you've hit the export, it's gonna export that file based on, again, the parameters that we set up here of the file locations of where we said we wanted to export the file and it's exported that file. So now that file is put on a, a server which we've got a, a job that, that submits to the FTP site for CDP, then they send it to them. Once they receive it, they send a file back saying it's been accepted. And if, if you're not on the accelerated payment program, you can take a month or two to get your check. But if you're on the accelerated program, which you have to sign up for for CDP, you can get it within two weeks. And then that's how your payment is collected. Now, if they wanna come in and audit you, you have, all the traceability, you have the drawback number, you have all the all the FIFO layers that it was matched to, all the purchase or movement journals that it was attached to. And if you also, if you've attached your um, entry 75015 file or your commercial invoices or your B3 exports to Canada and those commercial invoices, they can be all right here. So it's a one-stop shop for you to be audited if, if you ever are audited and the prove out that you've done a FIFO layer, you are within the time fence, you are matching, you are submitting money that you're legally obliged to get back because of the drawback duty drawback program, and it's all contained with AX2012, and um, that's how the program works. So all this code, again, uh, reiterate, completely independent of any base AX code or any customized code. So you can put this install in your AX2012 implementation and never have to worry about it conflicting with or having to do regression testing because it's it's adding layers on top of objects you've customized. This is all net new objects, so it's an easy add-on and it's an easy way to set up as you can just see as you can just see from the demo. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Again, my name is Jason Green, and this is a demo of AX2012 Duty Drawback.